everyone. Welcome to Agile Cast, a podcast series for Agile enthusiasts from CBI Agile Community of Consulting and Transformation. That is a community of seasoned Agile coaches and passionate Agile enthusiasts. We live by our core value of knowledge sharing, which is the only way you learn and care about your community. We have been hosting webinars, meetups, and annual conference named Agile NCR. and of lately we decided to share our podcast series which can help our fellow agile enthusiasts in exploring the well proven solutions in the space of business agility in this series i am going to talk about personal change journey neuroscience of change and finally using patterson's model for bringing the change like most of you i come from an it background so for me Change management was all about managing risks and ensuring operational handover of IT system, its complexities and its interdependencies. So when I was part of the first agile adoption initiative, we did all our preparatory work including configuration of MIS, documentation of new way of working, etc. And once the change was approved, we rolled out the change to the teams like throwing spaghetti on the wall and anticipated rather prayed that some of those would stick but as it was destined the change failed and that's when i came to know that change fails predominantly because of two reasons because it tries to change the way we work and because it tries to change the way i work we denotes an organization with all its cultures and structures and if any change interferes with the organization's existing belief system itself it treats that new change as a virus as a threat to its existence and way of living and kills it imagine an organization with a predominant command and control culture where you plan to remove status reports which feeds into the controlling management good luck on the other hand if you try the same with an organization having collaborative culture the outcome will be very different so yes The culture of an organization plays a very important role in any change adoption. But it is also an equally if not more important the I part, how I work. And this is purely an individual's decision. And these individuals are the most complex system within an organization. An organization's change is a cumulative product of individual's personal change journey. And every individual goes through this emotional roller coaster ride at different rates and different intensities how people will respond to change is difficult to predict and it's all about understanding the perspective of people affected by the change at this point let me share my learnings on how our brain perceives change but before that a bit of neuroscience the current structure of our brain is the product of millions of years of evolution the first is the primitive brain the reptilian complex which is involved in survival and reproduction and as we evolved we developed the mammalian brain the limbic system which manages our emotions and social aspects and finally the human brain the neocortex which gives us an ability to rationalize and think logically now as we know our brain consumes 20% of our overall energy every single day to help us conserve energy now again due to survival reasons the brain has developed to hardware the repeated behaviors so they become automatic we call these as habits habits are found in the area of our brain called the basal ganglia the more often you perform an action or behave in a certain way the more it gets physically wired into your brain this amazing adaptive quality of our brain is known as neuroplasticity So when a person learns to do something such as typing on a keyboard the brain develops connection points across the brain that enables their fingers to tap out letters words and sentences repeat this over and over and that person no longer has to think to type now imagine the qwerty keyboard getting replaced with a better designed keyboard to use it requires a new way of typing the brain doesn't like this It has invested a lot of energy to enable the current way of typing and to learn this new way of typing brain must develop new neural connections and this is physically training work 
So the brain releases those noxious neurochemicals when a person attempts to change the new behavior, such as using a pinky finger instead of the thumb to hit the space bar. The brain is screaming, stop, that's not how we do this, because it wants to stay in that autopilot and conserve energy. Change is about forming new wirings and habits and behaviors. Change programs must account for the time, space and resources people need to get their brains wired for the future state. So how can we harness neuroplasticity for change? By tapping into emotions. Our brain has some kind of a reward mechanism related to inside, giving a little feeling of positive reinforcement. The way to get past our brain's defenses of conserving energy is to help people come with their own resolutions regarding the concepts. Doing the thinking for employees takes their brain out of the action and makes them disengaged. And when disengaged, they will not invest the energy necessary to make the new connections required to change the behaviors. Worse, in that situation, they may instead focus their energy on the negative, fearful signals, deepening and reinforcing their resistance to change. In trying to focus people's attention on personal insight and changing their behavior, we engaged the people affected by the change in order to design the change. Voicing ideas created more activity and connectivity in the brain than hearing an idea spoken by someone else. The best way to get people to change is to lay out the objective in very basic terms and then ask them how they would go about getting there. But the next part was, what proper structure of questions to ask to engage them? While the rational side of our brain is looking for the answer to the ability aspect of the change, can I do it? The emotional side of our brain is looking for the answer to the motivational aspect of the change. Is it worth the effort? So let's start with the personal motivation then. So the source one of personal motivation, making the undesirable desirable, answering the question whether you want to do it. For this, start with experimenting it yourself firsthand. Just try it and then tell a story to people whom you are engaging for the change. Telling a story can help create vicarious experience. If you see some positive curiosity, show them in the act of doing. This works when people are reluctant to try something on their own. Then give them the time for self-discovery. Telling people what they should value leads to resistance lead them to self-discovery, the connection between the action and the belief itself. And finally, and with an invitation for people to act, people are more motivated when they have a feeling that they have a choice. But people simply cannot change through sheer motivation alone. Improvement can be achieved through deliberate practice. Next comes source two, personal ability, surpassing your limits, answering the question whether you can do it. For this, if the large goal seems to be challenging and frightening, it will create fear that they will never achieve success. This fear leads to costly failure. So break that big goal into mini goals. Provide them with short-term specific manageable goals. And then as they master that goal, gradually introduce tasks that need an additional help. Be available to provide more specific feedback. So now it should be good, isn't it? We covered personal motivation and ability. But we human don't exist in isolation. We people are a highly social creature. Note that the worst punishment in prison is solitary confinement. The worst punishment in prison is to take away from those murderers, rapists and convicts and put by yourself. That's how social we are. We prefer hanging out with other undesirable people than being left alone. So we need to address the motivation and ability aspects from the social and structural perspectives as well. So here comes source three, the social motivation, harnessing peer pressure, answering the question whether other people encourage the right behavior and discourage the wrong behavior. And for this, engage and involve people from whom everyone respects. They can easily persuade any social network to either follow through with change or can grind the change into a halt. The good example is social proof. 
people accept, accept the actions of others when they are unable or unwilling to determine the appropriate mode of behavior driven by the assumption that others possesses more knowledge of the situation. Next comes source 4, social ability, finding strength in numbers. Answering the question whether other people provide or are available for help. For this, consider what help and cooperation individuals may need when facing challenges in their new behavior. They use the social capital built over time in order to help succeed in those complex changes. So let's have source 3, social motivation, harnessing peer pressure, answering the question whether other people encourage the right behavior and discourage the wrong behavior. For this, engage and involve people whom everyone respects. They can easily persuade any social network to either follow through with the change or can grind the change into a halt. Social proof is a very good example. People accept the actions of others when they are unable or unwilling to determine the appropriate mode of behavior, driven by the assumption that others possess more knowledge of the situation. And then next, source 4, social ability, finding strength in numbers, answering the question whether other people provide or are available for help. For this, consider what help and cooperation individuals may need when facing challenges in the new behavior. Then use the social capital built over time in order to help succeed in those complex change situations. And then source 5. Structural motivation, designing rewards and demand accountability, answering the questions whether the environment like reward, pay and promotion encourage the right behaviors or discourage the wrong behaviors. It's important that people are doing the right things from personal motivation than the external rewards. So be careful on what rewards you introduce. Check that people actually value the reward and then link rewards to vital behaviors you want people to demonstrate. And yes, reward the right behavior even if the results are not as what you expected. Reward the right behaviors and the results will follow. And finally, the source 6, structural motivation. And finally, the source 6, structural ability, changing the environment, answering the question whether the environment enable or support the right behavior or discourage the wrong behaviors. For this, make structural changes to your environment so as to make the behavior you want easy and make the behavior you don't want difficult. For example, moving things closer or further away. Put reminders in key spots to help people remember how to act. Leverage tools, structures, policies, etc. And yes, go create this change journey along with the team. So next time if you are tempted to assign labels to people's resistance to change, translate that resistance into something more humane, avoiding danger, protecting finite energy and resources. And when planning a change, be sure to minimize surprises and create meaningful opportunities for people to conceptualize the future state. And you do this when you help address the curiosity, can I do it? And is it worth the effort?